The 2023 Rutgers football team was the second squadron coached by Greg Schiano to participate in a bowl game. And they were the first under Greg Schiano to win a bowl game in his second tenure, mind you. Greg Schiano won the Texas Bowl, the International Bowl, the Papa John's.com Bowl, the St. Petersburg Bowl, and the Pinstripe Bowl while at Rutgers in the Big East Conference in his first tenure with the Scarlet Knights. But we're only talking about his second tenure because that's the one that matters. His first tenure was well over a decade ago. The 2023 Scarlet Knights were also the first football team to finish the regular season with a 500 or better record since the 2014 Rutgers Scarlet Knights coached by Kyle Flood, who went 8-5, and 3-5 and five in the Big Ten Conference, and won the Quick Lane Bowl. This past Rutgers team went 6-6, six 3-6 and 3-6 six, and six in Big Ten Conference play, and they beat Miami, Florida in the Pinstripe Bowl. Rutgers has made slow but steady progress every year under Greg Schiano, and last year, whether it was games against Wisconsin, Ohio State, Penn State, where they were competitive for more than a half of football against teams that had so much more talent than them, Rutgers did a good job last year of punching above their weight class, competed with Michigan for a quarter, Wisconsin for three quarters, Ohio State really for three and a half, four quarters. They competed with Penn State for about a half, didn't really compete with Iowa or Maryland, but Rutgers did a good job and they beat a team in Miami, Florida that was more talented than them and they competed with multiple schools that were more talented than them from a standpoint of recruiting rankings and they, many of those teams also had higher preseason expectations. Last year for Rutgers was a success, but with over 40 two deep players returning, including Kyle Manungai, including Gavin Wimsat, including an impressive offensive line, including awesome linebackers like Tyreen Powell, Deion Jennings, Muhammad Torre, excellent defensive backs and Robert Longerbeam and Flip Dixon. Can this team make a big jump from 2023 to 2024? That's what we're going to be talking about today on College Football with Sam. Before we dive any deeper into this topic, though, a topic that has interested me since I would say December of 2023, so December of last year, I've been interested in Rutgers. Before we dive into that, please click that subscribe button, like this video, hit the notification bell so that you can get notified when I release more content on Rutgers football, Big Ten football, and college football in general. College football with Sam is the best Big Ten football channel on YouTube. You will not regret hitting that subscribe button and hitting the notification bell so that you can get notified every time a new video drops. Also, please pay attention to my community posts so that your vote can be included on my way-too-early Big Ten prediction video where I'll include record predictions and some college football playoff predictions and postseason predictions as well for the Big Ten Conference. I am going to feature a portion of that video dedicated to all of your votes combined on who you think the Big Ten champion will be and who you think the best defense and offense will be, etc. Plus, you'll get notified when my giveaway will occur, which that'll be announced once we hit 20,000 subscribers on here. And I'll also post on my community reminding you to check out my Patreon page, when I have a new little piece of bonus content on there. If you want to support the channel, speaking of which, check out my Patreon page and subscribe to that, or you can check out my merchandise page, and if you're a Rutgers fan, you could become the first of hopefully many in the future who will wear a College Football with Sam Rutgers t-shirt. That would be awesome. But that's all I have to say on that front. Let's get back into this video, into this topic. When I said I was interested in Rutgers since December of 2023, that doesn't mean I wasn't paying attention to them before then. That means that the topic we're discussing today 
can Rutgers win big? Will they win big? Can they even win double-digit games? That's been on my mind since December of last year, when everyone of importance, minus just a handful of players, announced that they were returning for Rutgers. This is even before the bowl game. Didn't matter if you lost to Mario Cristobal or not. The fact that Mario Cristobal, with that talent roster, lost to Rutgers, and part of that loss was because of a blocked punt, I think is absolutely hilarious, but that's beside the point, tells you something. The buy-in for this program and for this culture is high. And that's a good sign, because after being ran into the ground and having very poor culture and a lack of discipline on the player front and on the field and off the field front for Kyle Flood and Chris Ash just destroying Rutgers, only having one season where he didn't have double-digit losses in 2017 and in 2018, 19, and 16, never won a Big Ten conference game. The fact that Greg Schiano came in, won three conference games in 2020, won three last year, and then won a combined three from 21 to 22. That's not world beater in a general college football sense, but this is Rutgers we're talking about. And it has taken Greg Schiano this long to get them back to a consistent standard. And they had their first winning season since 2014, a decade ago, just last season. And I think that you have to give Greg Schiano praise for that, praise for rebuilding the culture, for getting large buy-in from players, and for putting his staff together and maintaining his staff. I bet that there were a lot of coaches, not just a handful, but a lot of coaches on that Rutgers staff, which others would like to have, particularly on the defensive side of the football. But... Can they win 10 games or more? Can they be a top 25 team? Can they be a good football team? That's what we mainly want to focus on. And I think a good starting point for that is to brush over the 2024 schedule. Because on College Football with Sam, we like to talk about top 25 teams in a sense of more power rankings than deserved rankings based off of record. I'm more into power rankings than I am. All 10 win teams should be ranked ahead of all nine win teams. But that's just my opinion. But I do want to look at things from almost an AP poll type of perspective. A top 25 Rutgers would probably have to have a 9-3 and three regular season record, 10-2, and 8-4. and four. Who knows? That's maybe territory, though. Let's check out their schedule. They open up the season on August 31st, hosting Howard. They host Akron September 7th, the following weekend. They have a bye September 14th before traveling on the road at Virginia Tech September 21st. They host Washington to kick off conference play September 28th. They play at Nebraska October 5th, host Wisconsin, which could be a revenge spot on October 12th, host UCLA October 19th, travel at USC On October 26th, which so far looks like the hardest game on this schedule, they have a bye November 2nd. They host Minnesota November 9th, play at Maryland November 16th, host Illinois November 23rd, and they play at Michigan State November 30th. The Big Ten Championship game for context is Saturday, December 7th. Rutgers has several advantages, and I think the schedule that I just threw out to you is one of them, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. The bottom line, the biggest advantage here is that Rutgers returns 74% of their 2023 production. They rank 8th nationally there in that statistic. In S&P Plus, Bill Connolly released that under a week ago, exactly five days ago, actually. Rutgers is 43rd in S&P Plus, projected to have the 94th best offense, the 17th best defense, the 33rd best special teams unit. I think the special teams unit, just from that power power ranking standpoint, is underrated in Bill Connolly's metrics. Can't necessarily say he's inaccurate on the offense or defense front. Both of those numbers would be anywhere from slight to sizable improvements compared to last year's 
numbers for Rutgers, but they return a ton of their production. The offense returns 10 starters and 69% of their production from the 96th scoring offense. The D returns nine starters and 79% of their production from the 34th ranked scoring defense. I'm going by scoring offense and scoring defense and not only by efficiency, because that's what matters at the end of the day. I love efficiency metrics. I love S&P Plus offense, defense. I found at least a new affection for it since I've gotten ESPN Plus. But scoring matters. As Paul Christ, former Wisconsin head coach, put at Big Ten Media Days with absolutely no personality, he said, all that matters is that you score more points than you allow. And there's that, that is college football. That is how you win games, obviously, through winning the point system. Rutgers' offense last season scored 23.2 points per game, 96th in the country. But you know what's funny? I can name more than half of the Big Ten that was worse in that category, just off the top of my head. Michigan State, Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, pretty sure Purdue, I don't know exactly about Illinois, but I can say also Indiana, Northwestern. That's seven. That's half the conference who I'm pretty confident had a worse scoring offense than Rutgers. Maybe, maybe Illinois. Maybe, I, I, I think I already said Purdue. I forget. The Big Ten last year was awful in terms of scoring offense. They were straight up awful. Rutgers defense, however, allowed 21.2 points per game, which is 34th nationally. And that would probably play or place in the upper third of Big Ten teams, but not close to the top as whether it's Iowa, Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State, Nebraska. I know for a fact that those five teams finished with better scoring defenses than the Rutgers Scarlet Knights did. But with returning production, heavy returning production in both of these areas, in areas like the offensive line and running back room, which were awesome for Rutgers, and on the defense everywhere, but particularly the linebacker room and secondary, there are reasons for optimism. That is an advantage. You look at Big Ten teams and their returning production numbers, we can start all the way from the bottom. Uh, Washington's 130th, Michigan 128th. Scrolling up the list here, it might take some time to get to the next Big Ten team. You got Purdue at 96th, UCLA at 95th, USC almost missed them at 99th. If I miss a team, oh well. Indiana, 85th. We got Michigan State at 73rd. We have Ohio State at 70th. We have... Hmm. Getting up here. Iowa at 30th. Oregon at 28th. Penn State at 23rd. Wisconsin and Minnesota at 20th and 19th, respectively. And Rutgers is there at 8th. Only Northwestern and Nebraska return more production than Rutgers. I think I missed Illinois and some other team. Yeah, Illinois at 65th. I missed them. But that's beside the point. Rutgers is the third best team in terms of returning production. And also, quick note, all of their starting defenders projected by rlads.com are seniors. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven projected offensive starters are seniors. The rest are juniors. So this is not just a team that's returning a lot of production, but maybe last year they were very young, We'll see if they're developed. These are seasoned veteran players who are hungry for wins, who have seen the progress that they themselves and their collective team have made every year. That's huge. That's big for team morale, again, for culture. And with a schedule that avoids Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, and Oregon, who I think are the top four teams and probably the tier one in the Big Ten next year, that's big as well. And we can't forget that kicker Jai Patel and punter Flynn Appleby are returning as well. I'm not going to dedicate a whole five minutes to the special teams unit. I don't do that for really 
any team, not because they're an afterthought, but because there's only two, three, or four main players on special teams. But Patel made 33 out of 34 extra point attempts. He made 15 out of 18 field goals. So over 80, 80% of his field goals are made at 78 total points. Flynn Appleby averaged 39.6 yards per punt with 57 punting attempts and over 2,000 punting yards. It's good to have him back. At punt returner, Christian Dremel is projected to start there, returning starter, and Deshaun Benjamin at kick returner is projected to return. And also from the transfer portal, Rutgers got BYU's Austin Riggs, or former BYU long snapper Austin Riggs, and they bring in some other transfers and recruits. But that's more of an afterthought advantage that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Circling back to the schedule. I think that Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, and Oregon are going to be not just some of the best teams in the Big Ten, but in the country nationally. Yes, Michigan loses a ton, and Ohio State loses more than a lot of people advertise. But Michigan, I think, still, at least at this very moment, has a system in place that Jim Harbaugh, Ben Herbert, and Sharon Moore and Jesse Minter built. And I think that that system, especially in year one, is going to help Michigan, even though they lose a ton. For Ohio State, they're the most talented team in the Big Ten by recruiting rankings. They, I think, have the best transfer portal class in the country, getting Caleb Downs, Julian Sayan, Quinshawn Judkins, and other, other players, which, I mean, the fact that there are more players than that, tight end from Ohio, Seth McLaughlin, O-line from Alabama, and I might be a oh, Will Howard. How could I forget Will Howard, quarterback from Kansas State, who's gotten praise in the preseason already by coaches and players from Ohio State. Penn State's top 25 in returning production. Oregon is top 50. Oregon has the best incoming high school recruiting class in the Big Ten. And Penn State, with Andy Kotelnicki at OC, I think is going to be dangerous. Rutgers avoids all all of those teams, their toughest game from the looks of it, factoring in travel time, home, away, and talent, and how good I think each team's going to be next year, their toughest game is probably going to be at USC. And USC last year was an 8-5 and five team that nearly lost to Cal and could have went Honestly, there's a universe where last year's USC team goes 5-7. and seven. They could have lost to Arizona. They could have lost to Colorado. They could have lost to California. I mean, they had five regular season losses. You could have added another two or potentially even three. I mean, that offense was wicked. It was good. But it wasn't as good as the 2022 offense for USC. And their defense stank who's the least efficient unit in the country, took way too long for Grinch to be fired there, and I think USC will still be suffering the consequences of that next season, despite hiring an elite defensive coordinator, an awesome defensive staff, which features DeAnton Lynn as the D.C., and even former North Dakota State head coach Matt Entz as a position coach. But that's for a USC video. Rutgers has the advantage of returning large amounts of production, they return key starters. They have an easy schedule. And Shiana retained most of his staff, again, with the veteran players. Ethan Kaliakmanis, Dimer Miller, Dino Kaliakmanis, Malcolm Ray, and Austin Riggs were the five incoming transfers. And Rutgers fielded a top 40 high school recruiting class, which included four stars Antonio White and Gabriel Winowich, wide receiver and athlete respectively. So decent recruiting class, really hand kind of hand size, tiny size, fun size transfer portal class, and an easy schedule. I mean, there are so many advantages. We could talk about this all day, but I think we have to move on. And I want to talk about the offense, we'll talk about the defense, and then we'll go from there. The Rutgers offense, what it was last season and what I expect from it this year, they were coordinated, and still are coordinated, by Kirk Shiraka, who spent time at Minnesota under P.J. Fleck for two tenures, briefly at Penn State in 2020 before James Franklin unceremoniously kicked him out the door 
in a season where uh, James Franklin earned his 0-1 record against Scott Frost. Goes to show how good of a game manager James Franklin is. Kirk Schrock has been everywhere around the Big Ten. And he even had an offensive analyst position at West Virginia. So he's familiar with the area Rutgers plays in because he also coordinated there under Greg Schiano in his first tenure with the Scarlet Knights. So he's familiar with the area, familiar with the Big Ten. He commanded an awesome Minnesota offense that featured Tanner Morgan, featured, I think Chris Altman Bell was a young receiver on that team, but more importantly, there were Rashad Bateman. Yes, Rashad Bateman, and then one other receiver whose name that I forget, who also went into the NFL. Briefly forget his name, but it was a it was a great offense that season. Ibrahim was the backup running back that year. That was eleven and two, top ten Minnesota team. PJ Flex best team. He orchestrated that offense. So he knows how to get the most out of his players, turn diamonds in the rough into diamonds, and execute awesome rushing offenses. And that's what we saw from Rutgers last season. These are some pretty jarring numbers here. Rutgers fielded a 1,000-yard rusher in Kyle Manungai. Samuel Brown V and Gavin Wimsatt had 200 yards or more. Rutgers in total had 24 rushing touchdowns. They only had 10 passing touchdowns. They ran for 168.7 yards per game and averaged 4.2 yards per carry and 1.8 rushing touchdowns per game. They only passed for 137.5 yards per game and 22.6 attempts, and they completed less than 50% of their pass. I mean, yeah, jarring numbers there. And that was Rutgers best passing offense in several years, which just goes to show how bad Rutgers football has been since they've joined the Big Ten. All starters except wide receiver Jaquay Jackson and offensive lineman Ireland Brown return, and this includes a 1,000-yard running back in Kyle Manungai. Manungai is great, let me tell you. 5.2 yards per carry against Big Ten defenses last season, eight rushing touchdowns, 1,262 rushing yards on 242 carries. He led the Big Ten in rushing yards at the end of the season. Just an overall impressive player, has a power ability. I like him, and I like that four of his offensive linemen returned who were opening up holes all day in the 2023 season. The passing offense, I think, has to take a step forward. I think it will. I think that Shiraka, he was with Rutgers in his first season as OC in 2023. At least first season in his second tenure with the Scarlet Knights, obviously. I think in year two, you're going to see his offense take big steps forward, leaps and bounds forward. In other areas, I think that they'll be around the top 50 this year, whether it's inside the top 50 or just outside. I don't exactly know, but I know that they'll have an excellent run game in terms of passing attack. I have no clue what that will look like, but I anticipate that it will be average rather than bad or below average. An excellent run game, average passing attack. I think that this offense will look like a Walmart version of the 2021 Michigan offense with more athleticism at quarterback with Gavin Wimsatt. I mean, he does a really good job running the football, but with the power backs in mainly Kyle Manungai, but you also have Samuel Brown, the fifth, who's younger, had a pretty good 2022 season that was cut short due to injury, a veteran deep offensive line, an underrated wide receiver room, though I don't think it will be as good as the 2021 Michigan units was. And really the main focal point of that offense, I think, will be the offensive line and the running back room. So that's what I expect Rutgers' offense to look like. They only scored a third of a point per play in last year, which is 87th in the country. They were 96th 
in scoring offense, only scoring 23.2 points per game. And they had some... The offense got shut out by Iowa, only scored six against Penn State, had one really flukish touchdown, which was a Christian Dremel slant route against Michigan. They looked impressive at times against Ohio State, but a large portion of that was they were chewing up clock, running the football, which plays directly into Rutgers' hands since Ohio State likes to be very conservative and plays wide technique with their defensive front, which means it's easier to run in Ohio State than it is to pass in them just from a schematic standpoint. The Rutgers offense got saved by turnovers against Michigan State. They only scored 13 against Wisconsin. They looked lethargic at times against Virginia Tech, Northwestern, Maryland, and it took a blocked punt to reinvigorate their chances of winning against Miami, Florida in the pinstripe bowl. So there, there's a long way to go for this offense to be good. I'm not going to declare here that it will be good, but I think average above average is more likely than bad. So it, don't be surprised if I become more solidified in my opinion that this will be a good, maybe even close to great, like the midway between great and good of an offense entering 2024. But for now, I'm going to err on the side of above average with an excellent, maybe elite running game. But the passing game is so important. Having versatility is so important. So if you have an elite run game, but you can't pass the football, you really have an average, even below average offense. Because if all you can do is run the football and you do it very well, well, defenses will only have to defend that one point, and they will they will be able to limit your offense pretty easily. It's important to be two-dimensional, even three-dimensional, if you want to go unique and do trick plays and mess with opponents' heads. But right, right now, I, it, it's just hard to see this offense being anything more really than one-and-a-half-dimensional, having an excellent running game, but a passing game that we don't know what that'll look like, especially when you lose Jaquay Jackson. You return Christian Dremel at wide receiver, and that's big, and you also return Isaiah Washington, but losing Jaquay Jackson, who is a senior and veteran, is a big loss, especially when the passing attack has struggled like it has. Let's talk about the Rutgers defense. They're coordinated by Joe Harasimiak. I did not know how to pronounce his name before today, and I hope that I pronounced it right. R.I.P. to me if I didn't. His defense only allowed 21.2 points per game, which was 34th in the country in scoring defense last season, and they allowed 0.343 points per play, which was 41st. So a defensive unit that was good, that was great in some instances, but they were not elite and they were not near elite either. The good news is for Rutgers is to my knowledge, pardon me, only one starter leaves. Maybe two, but I think it's just one. Uh, Torre, Jennings, and Powell return at linebacker. Muhammad Torre, Deion Jennings, Tyreen Powell. I wouldn't be shocked if this is the best linebacker core in the country next year. This is a unit that tackles well, that... I think did a pretty good job of stopping the run, an even better job of stopping the pass. You look at who led the team in sacks, it was Muhammad Touré with four and a half. He had nine and a half tackles for loss, an interception, forced fumble, two passes defended, and 93 total tackles. Deion Jennings led the team in total tackles with 95. He had four and a half tackles for loss, four passes defended. And... Max Melton departs. That was the one starter that Rutgers lost. He had three picks, a sack, four tackles for loss, and six passes def defended, and a forced fumble and fumble recovery. That will be that. That will be a tough loss. I'm not going to lie. That'll be a tough loss. Also, I do think Aaron. No, Aaron Lewis comes back. That's crazy. I mean, the amount of returning production that Rutgers has on defense. The fact that all of their starters are projected to be seniors is absolutely insane. This linebacker core is going to be elite. I think the secondary will also be elite. The D-line is an area where I have questions, but we'll touch on that in a few minutes. 
the defense overall has the potential to be top 10. I made a video just a day ago at the time of this recording talking about Nebraska's defense and how I think it will be a top 10 unit. Rutgers, I think, is in a similar position, but I'm much more confident in Nebraska's D-line, and they did right with the portal and also with development at linebacker, and their secondary, I think, has a similar upside, if not a potentially higher upside, than Rutgers does. But we'll just have to wait and see. I definitely give D-line to Nebraska. Linebacker, I'd give to Rutgers, which is the most important position on the defense, I think, is linebacker. Defensive back would be close to push, but I would lean Nebraska right now. I think they have the potential to be top 10, but they have to do a better job at stopping the run. This defense does. The defense in passer efficiency allowed was top 20, maybe even top 15, and they were able to frustrate Kyle McCord, limit Tanner Mordecai, but you know who really didn't? They struggled against Talia Tagovailoa and even against Deacon Hill. So they were they were up and down at times, though I think part of the defensive struggles were due to the fact that Rutgers' offense was very one-dimensional, and there were times where their defense was on the field all day long. But they have to do a better job of stopping the run. They were not even top 40 in rushing yards per game allowed. And Rutgers is a team that likes to slow things down, They like to chew up clock, and if you can't stop the run and you want to chew clock, that can sometimes be a dangerous combination, limiting your own possessions, but then by letting your opponent run the ball, you're letting them control the game as you're limiting your own possessions, which really limits your offensive production. It already doesn't help that Rutgers, as of now, does not have a good offensive reputation. So... The defense has to step it up. They have to do a better job of stopping the run. I do think they have top 10 potential, as shown by Bill Connolly in both returning production, where Rutgers is 6th in defensive returning production, also S&P Plus, where they're 17th in defensive S&P Plus, and they were top 20 in defensive efficiency per ESPN's FPI. This unit is good. They have a lot of potential. They have a high ceiling, definitely the ceiling of being a top 10 defense or potentially a little greater than that. But there are areas that they have to work on. But this is definitely, along with special teams, the better side of the ball compared to the offense. Now, before we conclude this video and I give my final thoughts, I want to talk about areas that must improve for Rutgers to win 10 or more games, for them to be a top 25 team, and for them to make a big leap. Wimsat, number one, he was very inaccurate last year. He only completed 47.8% of his passes and had a 55.1 QBR, which was outside of the top 70. I think it was 76th, 77th in QBR. At wide receiver, I know that Wimsat and his inaccuracy didn't help the receiver core, but Dremel and Washington have to step up and the wide receiver core and the tight ends were not perfect. There were some drops, There were some bad routes. You know, this was not 2022 Ohio State, 2020-2019 Alabama, 2019 LSU. It was not the perfect wide receiver room where you had Devonta Smith and Jalen Waddell and you just, like, gave them Deacon Hill as quarterback. And, oh, well, you have good wide receivers, but your quarterback sucks. That's not what happened. It was a combination of a quarterback that was bad in passing the ball last season and a wide receiver room that I think was just average, maybe at best above average. Keep with Jaquay Jackson leaving, they have to, at minimum, try and be above average or average. And if Wimsat makes strides, him making strides is more important than the wide receivers making strides. But the wide receivers improving will also help in the passing game. I think running back is great. I think the offensive line has the potential to be elite. At tight end, Johnny Langan's coming back, and there are also seniors and juniors in there, like Sean Bowman and Victor Konopka. Konopka. Hopefully that was the correct pronunciation. So I think tight end is good. So quarterback and wide receiver, and on defense, I would say the defensive line. And I would say in particular the interior. 
defensive line. Rutgers' interior defensive line was movable, and I am not going to be one to criticize Aaron Lewis, who was one of the leaders in the team in tackles for loss and sacks. Rutgers was top 20 in passing defense, but only 45th in rushing defense. And I typically count passing defense as average rating allowed because it's an average, and unless you're like Notre Dame, who had some games where their secondary was looked flukishly bad, but then very good, Notre Dame's defense was very up and down at times. They had a probably an average floor and a, an elite ceiling. They never really had a bad game, but there were times where they had an average or below average game for their talent, and then the other, the game against USC, where they made Caleb Williams look like Kyler Murray in the NFL, like where that defense played all 11 starters at an NFL level, which was pretty incredible. The interior of really where I was going with is passing defense I measure not in the yards per game allowed category, because especially in garbage time where you're constantly passing, that can be deceiving. I think rushing yards per game is more accurate in a determining factor in terms of run defense. They were 45th in that category. The defense also had 21 sacks, which just, that means you're not getting to the quarterback. You're not getting pressure. That's not good enough. Rutgers needs to shoot for having probably 30 sacks or more next season again, being top 20, preferably with improvements in passing defense with how much they return, but being top 25 in run defense with a top 20 or top 15, top 10 passing defense would be absolutely lethal, especially with an easier schedule. Rutgers played Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State last season. They avoid all three this year, so statistically, they should automatically be better just with the improvements in their schedule and it being much easier and their team returning as much as they do. There there has to be improvement, particularly in these three areas, and I expect Rutgers to do very well. I don't have another slide to show here because I just want my, really my conclusion or what I, my prediction for Rutgers to be very brief, but I do think Rutgers is going to win double-digit games with that schedule. You'll just have to figure out if I'm going to be as bold as I already am, and I'm picking Rutgers to win 10 games, or if you think I'm going to be insane and I'm going to pick Rutgers to win 11 games. I think 12-0 and 0 is a, a large stretch, especially given USC on the road, which I think is an obvious loss. But all those other 11 games, I think, are incredibly, incredibly winnable. So you have to figure out whether I'm picking them to go 10-2 and 2 or 11-1, and 1. Yes, I do think Rutgers will be a top 25 team next season. I do think they will make a big jump. But for more specific details on that, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can get notified when I release my way too early Big Ten record predictions video. And you'll see my record prediction for Rutgers, who I have them losing to, and also some key additional thoughts on that team. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I want to give a shout-out to Crash2488 and Justin Rogg for being Heisman patrons. I want to give a shout-out to Spencer Bringhurst and Armani Torres for being All-American patrons. And thanks to Will Loftus, Gabriel Callender, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Chris Lane, Austin Christmas, Zubin Za, and Janisha Cockrell for being All-Conference patrons. If you sign up on my Patreon page, within a week, your name will be on here. Only if you're a paid member, though. And if you're an All-American or Heisman, you'll get access to my occasional weekly bonus content, typically in the form of blogs, but there may be a video here and there as well. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.